Good afternoon and welcome to this conversation on CRAN and Front Hall and the whole process of virtualization of the RAN that sensitively has written in collaboration with RCR Wireless. And today we're talking to Gilad Garon. He is the CEO and the founder of ASOX. Gilad, welcome to our conversation today. Thank you. And um, why don't we get started uh, uh, with uh, you telling us uh, uh, what's your involvement? How do you decide to start a company working on uh, uh, VRAM? Well, actually, the ASOX has been around since 2003. And in the first eight or nine years of the company, we were more focused on uh, the handset side of things. Um, and in 2012, we made quite a dramatic shift and we decided to switch the, uh, the company's main operation into RAN virtualization. Um, as was pub publicly, uh, as public knowledge, we started out with uh, working with the likes of China Mo Mobile and Intel in the early days of, of CRAN. And as this industry matured and virtualization uh, took hold over the industry, we, we found that there's an opportunity not just to sell silicon technology, but rather to offer a full NF3 component solution end to end. And this is when we decided to focus our efforts solely on building virtual base stations rather than, than doing silicon engines for the industry. So you, you, you moved pretty pretty early on, uh, pretty in the early days uh, to uh, the virtual, towards the virtual, in the virtualization path. Uh, what, what were the reasons? What, what made you make the decision? What were the drivers? Well, I can tell you that we, um, if, if we look back in, in this short history of the last couple of years, um, NFV uh, really started to, to, to become a mainstream ideology in the course of 2013. So we started actually with CRM a little bit before NFV was, was, was happening in a big way. Uh, and, but through the, the need to work with the Intel architecture, and once virtualization became mainstream, we were already native. We were, shall we say, NFV ready if you will, for the approach. So in the early days, we were thinking mainly about using virtualization technologies to solve capacity and cost of, of in the industry. But again, as this industry is maturing, we discovered that virtualization would not just be a cost reduction measure, but actually would be a, a the way that next generation networks are going to be designed. So uh, virtualizing the base station, which is a key component in the data path and in the cost structure of a network would need to be solved. And B, as we saw that services, end-to-end -end services from the evolved packet core all the way to the edge would require virtualization. So while we started with virtualization as a cost reduction measure, um, trying to leverage or leveraging the, the, you know, the intrinsic cost reduction of using IT equipment over proprietary telecom equipment. Later on, it became uh, sort of the springboard of moving into this NFV world. Um, yeah, and I, I want to get back to the cost uh, in, in a minute, but before we get there, I wanted to ask you the, the very basic question. What do you mean by CRAN and VRAN? There seem to be a lot of different concepts out there in the industry. So what is it as a, as a what is it you consider to be CRAN, VRAN, and how do they relate with, with each other? Okay, so um, again, as we started quite early on in the industry, the difference between CRAN and Cloud RAN was actually quite uh, marginal. Later on, the term CRAN was kind of quote unquote hijacked by uh, traditional uh, base station equipment vendors who said, okay, the revolution would be that we would centralize base stations into hubs. And the term CRAN became centralized RAN. 
So we were always from day one more focused on cloud RAM, which is a combination of centralization. Yes, centralization is a, you know, sort of like a necessity for this solution. But frankly, we were more focused on the cloud aspects of, of, of what we call cloud RAM. So now we, we simply use the word cloud RAM in order to differentiate from centralized RAM. VRAM is, is again, just another term to try perhaps to emphasize uh, the fact that we're talking about virtualization technologies over just, um, shall we say, uh, you know, in centralized RAM, actually, um, the, the revolution or, or the transformation of the industry is quite limited. So, um, um, you know, in, in, if I'm not mistaken, in places like Korea, Centralized RAM was already deployed as early as two or three years ago, and the results were quite marginal. Therefore, we, we see, uh, well, we respect, of course, anybody who uses centralized RAM to explain what he's doing. Uh, we feel that it's, it's not enough in order to convince uh, networks to move to a new topology. Or, or the benefits of centralizing base stations are quite marginal. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay, so now we can go back to the cost and benefit, functional benefits uh, uh, issue. Uh, as you said, I think it's very interesting at the beginning for a lot of uh, players, the, the first uh, impulse was, well, we do CRAM because of the cost uh, savings and then realize there's also performance savings and uh, especially in terms of using your network resources efficiently uh, because you have what you have, but in terms of spectrum, so your spectrum limited as an operator necessarily because there's just so much you have. But what the CRAN allows you to do is to optimize that resource. And can you tell us how, how is that possible? How does that work? Well, you're absolutely right, Monica, that the cost of spectrum is a key component of uh, when you look at the total cost of deploying this new virtualized or cloud run networks. And, you know, just the latest numbers, the, the staggering numbers of, of the latest bid for, for Spectrum in the United States where, you know, the price literally tripled over several months and, you know, maybe it's 43 or 44 billion or whatever the number is. But these staggering numbers show that this industry, the Spectrum, is really the most scarce resource and not, you know, um, you know computation cost. So if you'd go and ask any radio manager on the planet, would he want or would he favor a solution that uh, brings more processing power to solve Spectrum? He would tell you, absolutely, bring me as much processing because Spectrum is scarce for me. Processing power is, you know, especially in the world of cloud computing, is limitless. And this is actually, uh, um, this is the core of the matter. So what Cloud RAN actually enables is to do exactly that. The scalability of throwing, essentially, you know, every processing uh, resource is limited, but essentially for the problem at hand, it's literally unlimited. Because, uh, um, you know, the scale of data centers and the amount of computing power which is available today on, on server technology enables to, to throw this DSP processing at the problem. And for that, you actually need also the centralization. Because if you have a remote site where the antenna or the cell tower is completely isolated, then the ability to bring unlimited processing to that tower is, you know, would not make economical sense. So in order to solve spectrum problems by using shall we say, excessive processing power, you need to have the processing power located in some centralized location. Mm -hmm. And then you want to have all these antennas connected. Now, by intuition, just to give you the basic outline uh, around the two main mechanisms of solving spectrum, one of them, um, which you for sure heard many a time, is, is called COMP, which is, stands for Cumulative Multipoint. And essentially, the way I like to explain comp is using the, the positive side of interference. So 
You know, this industry for the last 30 to 40 years is only focused on signal to noise ratio. How to reduce interference of a, a single handset with a single tower. And treats actually the rest of the towers as enemies for this cause, as the noise. While Comp says, let's use all this additional signaling out there to enhance the signal. So this is one, shall we say, approach. The other one which is starting to happen and we, we're happy to be a part of is more in the air, area of what is called CSON, or Cloud Self-Organizing Networks. So self-organizing networks is a relatively new field or automated self-organizing network. But using cloud technologies for that actually enables um, a real-time adjustment of existing networks and new CRAM deployments or cloud RAM deployments together to enhance. So I know these are quite, you know, they have some similarities, but they also have uh, several differences. But whether the market moves more into comp or moves more into CSON or together using both technologies, the result would be the same. We would see significant spectrum enhancement. And when I mean significant, you know, even the conservative numbers that I'm, we're seeing out there are talking about between 20 to 35 percent. And judging by cost of spectrum worldwide, we're talking about tens of billions of dollars worth of savings. Yeah, and uh, and I think that um, uh, you know th this is very important because it, at the same time it's uh, the availability of tools like Comp or uh, Sun that are driven are uh, driving CRAN because th there have been a lot of trouble implementing Comp and Sun in the non CRAN environment. So at the same, it's sort of it's it's mutually reinforcing trend here, and uh, so how important do you see? Uh, the small cell deployments, because you, you use con and, uh, comp and sun mo most likely in, in uh, when you have small cell type of deployment as well. Uh, how important it is the small the, the development of the deployment of small cells uh, in driving CRAN or in CRAN driving small cells? Well, I think Monica, that the industry is actually trying to figure out what would be the uh, the role of small cells. So I think that now in 2015, we can already say without hints that the deployment of small cells is not as rapid and as dense as was originally thought. But that does not mean that small cells would not play a part. And by intuition or the way I like to see it, I see a clear difference between indoor and outdoor when it comes to the role of small cells. So I still see a lot of merits in the residential, um, what used to be called femtocell kind of deployments. When you look at the enterprise or the near outdoor coverage of small cells, the differences between the, the DAS industry or, or this new DRAS industry and small cells are getting to the price and performance point where people are starting to ask questions. So I don't have the crystal ball to tell you exactly how they fit, but I would say that small cells would need to evolve as well, even before they've uh, made that financial success that they were hoping for. And we're starting already to see trends in, in the small cell forum talking about virtualization. Yeah. So, once these small cells are virtualized, the way we see them, they're just other, you know, they're just remote radio units as far as we're concerned. So whether they have onboard some signal processing or offboard, or are they integrated with Wi-Fi or not, and what have you not, as far as we're concerned, they're, they're just yet another resource for us either to virtualize or to co-manage through song. So I know it's a little bit of a long answer to your question, but it is, um, it is uh, you know, what happened, if, if you will, here is that small cells deployment uh, have lagged long enough 
for alternatives to be to, to become very interesting. And now this industry is going to need to figure out where they actually have a, uh, where they show value and where they have you know overwhelming advantage over other alternatives. And, uh, you know, you, you raise a very important uh, issue, I think, in the terms of the evolution from a, uh, almost an intellectual point of view, because, um, as you say, you know, once you have a, a C-run type of deployment, uh, a small cell, macro cell, they're all just one unit that you have to manage differently because the different features where it is and, uh, you know, all of that. But it doesn't make any sense then to talk about macro, small cells, micro cells, pico cells, or just... Uh, units in a CRAN environment. I, I, I absolutely agree with, with that, with your assessment. And the only thing uh, that, that will always need to be judged and managed is how do you manage legacy? And as you mentioned in early on in, in, in the questions you're about to ask me or the topics we want to discuss is exactly that. I mean, um, when you look at the evolution of CRAN, one of the things that Cloud RAM, shall we say, is that it was talking a lot about the issue of using it as a greenfield technology. But as this industry is maturing as well, we as players in the industry are getting more and more um, involved in how to have Cloud RAM as an additional capacity enhancement layer over traditional. Uh, you know, legacy equipment which is deployed out there. I mean, it wouldn't make sense for a carrier who's already in his second, third, or fourth year of LP deployment to consider greenfield kind of technology. So the way this industry is, is happening is it's just another layer on top of this head net. But what makes it quite unique, again, is that on one side it's a layer on top, but it's also a layer below. And this lay management layer below makes the equipment already deployed, whether it's you know, an incumbent uh, macro cell base station or a newcomer's small cell, just more productive. And eventually everybody wants to have their network more efficient and productive. And, and you, you know, you, you raise an important point. The legacy is important to the deployment of CRAN because if you have a greenfield deployment, the argument is pretty easy. It becomes a little bit more complicated when you go into the legacy, and yet most of the networks out there are legacy networks. So the success of CRAN and RAN virtualization depends on the fact that you can uh, adopt CRAN in, in 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 legacy networks. So how can you help operators to, to together? How do they do it? Because if you have a um, you know a, a network and uh, you, you cannot just do CRAN on a few cells here and there. You either do it or you don't. So it's 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 it's, it's diff, it, You know, ideally you want to have a gradual approach, but it's not that trivial with CRAN, right? How do you deal with that? That's true. So again, we need to. Uh, the problem is complex. We need again to look at what are the needs, and one of the areas that um, you could call it CRAN because it is part. Of, we call it micro CRAN is the in-building, in-campus, stadium, airports, what have you not, where, you know, depends on the statistics, but between 60 to 80% of LP data either starts or ends in, in these areas. And then you're looking at CRAN as, a, as a, the next generation DAS. Okay? So this is something which could be deployed gradually. Where you're absolutely right, where CRAN uh, is yet to prove itself, is how does it enhance capacity in already deployed areas? And for that, uh, exactly as we mentioned, uh, technology so such as cloud song would come into place, um, where uh, the basic logic is that if I have already a network out there, and but it's already connected to a song architecture, then potentially this uh, song management, and again, the the, 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 the industry is talking about various controllers, even all the way up to SDN controllers who, who do that. But in general, in an NFE environment, whether it's going to be an orchestrator or an NFE manager, 
or whatever you're not, what would be that entity? That entity would able to throw more resources at the problem. Mm -hmm. So what we envision, you would see cell towers or cell sites, which are actually hybrid. It means there is going to be a certain amount of on-premises DSP uh, processing, which is already geared and, and in many cases used together with, with the antennas. And there would be just free-floating RRUs out there in that cell site. And, and some of the virtual base station resources would either be deployed or, or moved away according to traffic. Mm -hmm. So um, the way we see it is just another layer of, 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 of coverage, which is cheaper and it's also more statistical. Therefore, again, making it more economical for the carriers. And, and I guess that, that also works in, in the sort of the evolution towards VRAN, where you're not going to have everything virtualized on day one. You just have to go through different phases. Can, can you talk about how you see that developing through time? Yes. Um, we all know eventually how it's going to end. One of the nice things about this industry is that it's clear that let's say, so people say 2020 or whatever the number they want to do, it's clear that the, the network is going to be virtualized. Otherwise, most of the benefits, the economical benefits, and uh, you know, the high-end application of machine-to-machine -machine and automation and what have you not, are not going to be effective unless the network is fully virtual. So that is something everybody understands. Where we saw where the industry is in today, um, you know, is it focused more on the places where it was quite easy to virtualize. So packet core processing, which was by definition more transaction oriented, is the first to move into virtualization. So this is definitely something that's already in, in early deployments. You're going to see throughout the course of 2015, a little bit of 2016, you know, the evolved packet core is virtualized. That's done. The, the only caveat about this statement is that it really only solves between you know 10 to 20 percent of of the cost and, and and the order of magnitude of the problem. So while it's quite crowded, the other areas of the network need to be virtualized as well. The base station is is again critical. Um, so if I if I had a little crystal ball, I would say that by 2018 you're going to see. Um, a great deal of the tier ones having, you know, a fair share of the network virtualized. What these carriers also are looking at and now is also what is their strategy towards 5G? And they do not want to repeat the same, you know, aching uh, experience that they had with 4G, although it was better than 3G. Mm -hmm. uh, so when uh, one of the nice things that they like about the, the, the VRAM or the virtualization of the radio is that it's, it's going to be quite native or serve as a perfect springboard to 5G and, and the network is actually going to be 5G ready. So the way these networks are looking at the problem, they're saying, okay, we're getting some benefits in 16 and 17, the bulk of the, the benefits in, let's say, 18 and beyond, but What's good for us is that we already have the layout, which is going to take us all the way into 5G with a software upgrade, essentially. So we will be truly be able to software upgrade our equipment as we go into 5G. Okay, now I need to to move to a, an argue, a topic that is somewhat controversial these days in, in CRAN, which is the front hall. And uh, some see it as, you know, that's what's going to stop CRAM from happening because you don't have front hall. Uh, others say, well, you can do this, you can do that to remove, to reduce the requirements. What do you think, is front, how do you deal with the front hall? Obviously, it's, it would be better if you didn't have so much requirements in terms of front hall, but how do you deal with that, with the requirements you have in the front hall? Well, first of all, we have to be true and direct to the industry. See. Cloud RAM requires, you know, an order of magnitude, whether it's 6x or 8x more backhaul, front haul resources, period. So there's no denial 
that the, 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 the uh, as we say, the limiting factor or the trading factor of the industry is availability of and cost of frontal. That is without argument. What was kind of you know the the, um, the layout of the industry was that for that reason cloud rand would be abundant and native to Asia, where frontal appears to be uh, much more available and very difficult to implement in, in Europe and the United States. And when we entered the, this market, that was also our perception. What we have started to learn is are two things. A, as we mentioned, when, when you look at the in-building market and DAS or DRAS market, frontal is not an issue because by definition, these markets are moving into optical you know, transport, literally in the walls. If you start to analyze uh, the network status in Europe and the United States, you're starting to discover, or we have discovered, that in many of the, of the, of the networks, this is again a non-issue. For some of them, it's an issue in specific cities or towns, sometimes not even necessarily because of technology, but because of issues that have to do with the way that they're buying their uh, they're buying their, their, their back hall or front hall uh, equipment or, or service. So the answer again is that it's not all black and white. There's going to be a lot of areas in which front hall will delay the, uh, the deployment of cloud RAM. But if you really look at the way that this industry is moving, I don't really see it as a significant barrier. Where we see the barriers are really, uh, A, the carriers need to make the decision that virtualization is the way to go. Most of them have, but at the end of the day, it also requires them to change somewhat their traditional business model. So that's a question mark that needs to be solved, you know, at management and boardrooms around the globe. It's less a technology factor the way we see it. I mean, pretty much other than some very specific use cases that we have heard, uh, the backhaul problem is, is not a fundamental you know, deal breaker or anything of that sort. It's, it's something that would res be resolved. Just to give you some very nice pointers, if you look at the United States and the way that fiber optics is being deployed, it's simply astonishing uh, the, the amount of of, of deployment of, that is going on literally in the last year and is planned for the next two or three years uh, by, by giant companies, by cloud companies. And the telecom industry, again, with leverage from, from the investments which are, which are happening on the planet because of, of cloud computing. Yeah. And that respect, uh, that respect uh, that's one solver of the problem. Perhaps another little bit, uh, bit of a story is a lot of the optical um, service companies gave up on telecom perhaps a little bit too early and, uh, and have focused on you know, banking and private network uh, transport of services and are now willing to look at the new light into telecom and all of a sudden again, resources that were not available to the industry are becoming available. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, talk a little bit about what you guys specifically do at ASOX. What's what sets you apart? What is it you do differently, or what's your focus? So I would say that what dramatically differentiates us over everybody else, or or, or most of everybody else, is that we took uh, the virtualization problem uh, or, or challenge from day one. And we aimed at solving it in a dramatic way. So we're not about taking, you know, legacy or existing architectures and refinding them at, at layer three or layer two or layer four that doesn't exist or whatever you're not. We're going all the way down to the core of the virtualization of the base station. In other words, what we're saying is that if you want to present a truly disruptive solution, you got to solve the problem at the core, and this is what we have done. So we have, we have took 
the challenge of how to run, you know, communication, real-time application, which by definition is deterministic and, and can never fail. And we are running it on IT equipment, which is by nature more statistical. And we have managed to bridge that gap between the statistical advantages of IT and, and but still being able to provide equipment which is reliable enough for telecom. And putting it a little uh, into more technical terms, we, uh, we look at layer one resources as just another compute resource. So in, in the classical NFT format, where the industry is looking at compute storage and networking, we added, if you will, another subsection into compute so for us, monolithic layer ones or monolithic phis don't exist anymore. We treat the, the elements of radio processing just like any other compute resource. So using our you know, core technologies that have been developed over a decade before and adding them to the classical you know, Intel architecture kind of an approach, we fuse these two together and now you have a DSP or a physical layer resource which behaves like a compute. And this is perhaps the dramatic gap difference or differentiator that we have over other players in the industry. Now, uh, in closing, what should we expect uh, uh, from ASOX uh, uh, and maybe from the industry in the next two, three years? Well, I would say that uh, 2015 is all about proof. So um, this industry is, is looking for proof points. It's looking for, it's moved from proofs of concepts. Carriers are now saying, okay, we got that. Let's start playing with this a little more seriously. Let's, not, let's start building some limited scale projects. And there's a lot of appetite in the carriers and other players to, to deploy small scale cloud RAN networks around the globe this year. Uh, all of them, uh, uh, shall we say, across the globe are looking at 2016 as the first year of commercial deployment, whether it's going to be in this uh, in-building or DRS uh, uh, topologies or some uh, layers of enhancement of capacity in urban areas. So what we're really looking at, and again, there's also things that need to mature as we all know in the NFV ecosystem, um, you know, everybody, or, or there's a lot of players who are offering little bits and bytes of this solution at the orchestration level and at the component level. So we're still going to need to see a lot of software integration and maturity of OpenStack and, and the NFV industry. But once these two parts kind of mature, we see, you know, later part of 2017 as a sweet spot of, of, of an industry takeoff. This is what we're seeing right now from all the discussions we're having. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's exciting. We'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, so, uh, Gila, thanks a lot for sharing your thoughts with us uh, today. Thank you very much, Monica, for uh, asking these questions. <laughs> well, thanks. So this conversation was part of a report on uh, uh, CRAN, front hole, and RAN virtualization. Sessions affiliates written in collaboration with RCR Wireless, and that's uh, available for download from uh, our website, the Sense Affili, and from RCR uh, Wireless Sense Affili as well. Thank you all for uh, uh, listening to us today.